The Club Championship Show on OTB in partnership with AIB. Proud sponsors of the Football Hurling and Camogie All-Ireland Club Championships. Hashtag the toughest. Welcome along to the Club Championship Show here on OTB. It is brought to you by AIB. Ballyhale Shamrocks are looking forward to their 11th All-Ireland Final four seasons in a row. They've now gone to Crow Park to the decider. They avenged their defeat last year against Ballygunner by winning when the sides met in the semi-final on Sunday afternoon. Deloy are awaiting the eight-time former champions in the final, the Cucullans, coming through against St. Thomas's of Galway in the first of the semi-finals. It's going to be the first time in 18 years that Deloy have gone to the All-Ireland Final. They've been unlucky previously losing out in four previous deciders. Sarsfields, meanwhile, of Galway are the All-Ireland Club Senior Camogie Champions again. They've gone back-to-back for the first time in their history and they're now champions three times in the last four years. Delighted to say Asher Riley is here with me. That was a hell of a weekend at Crow Park. You were there to witness it all. Yeah, I was there for all the games, Will. Um, brilliant weekend. Brilliant for Dunloy. You know, what a display. One of the shocks, what we love, I suppose, about the club's championship. But I think the Camogie overall was the, the best game of the weekend. We had the intermediate first and then the senior and Sarsfields against Lockheed Shamrocks. What a game, Will. You, you edge your seat stuff. You know, you couldn't take your eyes off it. Despite the fact there was a goal after 32 seconds and you're thinking, you're the thinking, yeah, might run this away is with it. This. Yeah, Sarsfields are just going to run away with it here. There's not going to be much competition. And my God, that wasn't the case at all. Lockheed were full value. Um, very disappointing for them but my god what a team you know they came up against Sarsfields who are so experienced at this point and you know they have superstars all over the pitch but Lockheel will be back and it was just such a brilliant game of Camogie you know I walked away saying brilliant you know so many people are going to be tuned into that and it's great to have that standard on show Yeah it was enjoyable as well that the Camogie had its own spot nicely away from Mm. other sports at the same time Um, I saw the picture I think you were in the picture of all of the journalists who were filing their copy they are getting things ready in the press room in Crow Park on Sunday afternoon because once Ballyhale, Shamrocks and Ballygunner came to an end the World Cup final was heading towards extra time. And I think even some of the Ballyhale players were staying in the dressing room to watch it on their phones. Yeah, I sort of thought that I'd be able to have my laptop on while the games are going on, you know, sneakily be able to have, you know, a glance over at it. And a few of the, the lads in the press box were doing that, but I couldn't do it. You know, it was too hard. But um, yeah, you know, we were hearing noises the whole way through of people shouting in, Messi scored, it's 2-0. I was like, no way, couldn't believe it. I said, grand, that's obviously, that's the way it's going to go. And then by the time the game had finished, Ballyhale, Shamrocks and Ballygunner, it was in extra time. So we were going down to do the, the post-match interviews. We did the managers and then no one from Ballyhale had come in for the players. And, you know, I said it to the PRO and that, you know, is there any chance any of the players? And he's like, they're in watching the World Cup. I can't get them out of the dressing room. I was like, oh, fair enough. <laughs> That's what I'd be at as well. Um, and yeah, then we went back upstairs then to Crow Park and everybody sat and watched the, the World Cup uh, penalties then, the shootout. And it was funny to watch all the GA jerseys journalist just hovering around a small enough screen and yeah it was very exciting to watch it but uh God, yeah. Why the two of them had to clash? Will we ever get over that one? Well, I don't know. I you don't know. know. We'll talk to Sarah Dunavant a bit about that a little yeah. bit later on in the programme when she joins us to look at the hurling semi-finals. We'll take a look at the uh, results then from the weekend gone by, uh, starting with those two games on Sunday at Croke Park. Uh, Ballyhale Shamrocks coming through. They, of course, were going for three in a row last year and lost out at the very last gasp from Harry Ruddle and he wondered if that was going to be a repeat uh, when Ruddle came on on Sunday afternoon. But Ballyhale Shamrocks beating Ballygunner by one goal in 16 points to six. 16 points and Dunloy overcoming St. Thomas's of Galway by 114 to 13 points. We also had the intermediate semi finals at Kingsman Breffney, Torrain of Mayo, uh, winners against Leitrim of Down by one goal in 18 to one goal in 14. They will play Monoline of Limerick in the final, they were 219 to 20 point winners against Bray Emmets of Wicklow. In the junior hurling semi finals, Bally Giblin of Cork back into the decider, being Horswood of Wexford by 112 to 8 points. And Eastgate of Sligo can look forward to that final after their victory against Kilburn Gales, the British champions by 3.15 to 4.6. The All-Ireland Camogie Finals across the weekend too as well. The Intermediate Championship Final was the first of the double header at Croke Park. A win for Clonduff of Down by 12 points to James Stevens, one goal and six. The Junior Championship Final was on Sunday afternoon in Ashburn. Roisin O'Keefe scored a hat-trick in that one as Lacken of Cavan beat Delvin of Westmeath by five goals and 12 points to three goals and two. And then as Ash mentioned, the All-Ireland Camogie Club Senior Final on Saturday evening. Sarsfields of Galway going back-to-back, defeating Lock Keel Shamrocks by two goals and 14 points to one goal and 14. I'm delighted to say that we've now got Michael Hopper-McGrath, the manager of Sarsfields with us. Uh, Hopper, how are you getting on? 
Oh, great, Will. Look, we're, we're on a high all the time down here in New Edinburgh. <laughs> I'd imagine, like, look at the achievement. Uh, Ash and I were just chatting before we came on air. So you think back to this Camogie team coming through and, like, they've been fostered, many of these players, from effectively a failure team into the team that they are now. But from your Galway title in 2016 to have gone to four successive finals and now to be able to say you've won three All-Irelands during that period as well, what a dream period for your club. Uh, yeah, look, at uh, I suppose in our wildest dreams, we didn't, you know... We always had it at the back of our mind, but like to have such success, particularly in the last four years, you know, it's uh, mind, mind boggling, really, you know, for a small club. Um, but it's a testament to the players, like the, the effort they put in and what they do, you know, both on the field and off the field. And, and like, you know, they're very ambitious and, and they, want to, they want to be the best as much as they can be. And for people who might not be familiar, they haven't had much of a break over the last three or four years either because of the way those championships kind of rolled into each other and then you had to finish this year out within the calendar year as well. You've been on the goal quite a bit now. Yeah, that's right. I suppose, like we say, we won the 2019 one in March 20. That's when they were always played at that time. Uh, but then there was the um, the situation with COVID and will it be on or will it not be on? So, like, that was played in the winter time then, the, the following winter. But, like, we had to be kind of doing a bit even who weren't doing it as a group who were doing it they were keeping themselves right so you were tuned in the whole time like and then like this year they brought it into the calendar year so yeah we're kind of three or four years without having um, any off time at all I suppose it's probably great now that it, had, it is played in the calendar year at least the girls can have three or four months off and they need it to be honest Yeah they can enjoy the Christmas a bit maybe compared to some of the teams who are getting ready to go back and play in January it, It's a yeah. championship that has to move without a bit of adversity along the way as well you know any team will suffer when an all-star isn't available for their club uh, with Aura McGrath injuring her knee you had Erica Leslie missing out and then you had Maria Cooney get injured during the game as well that was a lot of injuries to have to deal with in an All-Ireland final Definitely will like as was the last all in June with, with the dreaded cruise and uh, Erica had got a knee injury around the same time but like then we had the different stages where we were missing players she won, missed a couple of games she was in the boot stress fracture and then for the last few games like the likes of Maria Cooney Shannon Cochran and Florida, we didn't know whether we'd have them or not. They were probably playing the last, the semi final and the final. They played the most injuries. If, if you know, if right was right, they probably shouldn't be playing. But yeah, it was kind of, I'd say it got to the stage where, where we were resilient to anything that was going to be thrown at us because of that. And I'd say that helped us on the day too when Maria had, had to go. I think it was a normal time in the last Maria, you know, to be a bigger shock to the system, but it was like as if we were used to it and we just got on with it. Like, and Sarah came on instead of her after 20 minutes and gave us a great shift. You talk about a dream start, uh, 32 seconds into the game to get a goal. No better way to get settled into a match. Oh, yeah, sure. Look at it. It was, it was a dream, really. It was probably something we worked on called, uh, you know, isolation Siobhan inside and probably worked, tried it in every match for the last three or four years and eventually it came off, you know, and when it does, it's great. But um, uh, we were well aware because we'd know an awful lot about Lock Eel. They were in the shadows of Slock Neal there for years. I was up at Ulster Finals. that went to be a point to win it, went to extra time, replays. And like... They were every bit as good a team. It's just Schlock Neil, you know, which were a great team, just dogged it out and always got the result. But I always knew with Schlock Neil, you know, if they got over the line, to give them a bit of freedom. And like we played them in challenges two years and three years ago. And to be honest, which up in Evanston, and they gave us a lesson. They're a pure hurling team, very skillful. And, you know, they play Camogie, I suppose, the right way, to be honest. And they're, they're great, uh, great stick players. Yeah, Hopper, it was a brilliant game. I spoke to some of the Lock Eel players afterwards, Roshi McCormick in particular. She had a fabulous game. Some of her frees were just exceptional. And as you said, it was the skill level of them that was so impressive. And I'm sure going into the game that you expected that. But did you get a chance to watch the game back? Because I'm sure when you're on the sideline, you might be able to appreciate it as much. But I was just saying to Will before we come on, it was one of the, the best club games of Camogie I've seen in a long time. Yeah, yeah, we got it kind of, uh, we, we watched it, I suppose, there Sunday, Monday, well, kind of, there'd be a crowd around, so you wouldn't be kind of watching it in detail, but, um, yeah, sure, look at it, we took, we got five-point leads twice, and they came back, like, we got into a four-point lead again, we nearly, we nearly had to win the game three times, to be honest with you, you know, but, like, you know, they just kept, back, they kept throwing everything at us, like, but they had a right good full forward line, strong at midfield, uh, good defenders, like, and, we were under no illusions coming into that game, this was going to be a fierce, fierce battle, maybe, you know, outsiders of that in general when they say you're playing an Antrim club or Lock Eel, that you know, they don't kind of do their homework in it, but we were well aware of it. Like you often have a strong club team, you know, that's in a county that mightn't be extra strong. And it's, you know, it's irrelevant really to how their county team is going. You see the same way with Schlock Neal back the time. 
Yeah, big time. We were talking about that too, just and from hurling and camogie in particular. It's on such a high at the minute. And in particular, I thought Neve from midfield, she was superb. You know, she she was going to die out there to, to win some of those balls. She got a an early yellow card, but she she managed to, I suppose, calm herself for, for the rest of the game because I was a bit worried at that point. Because I'm sure you were very worried, I suppose, on the sideline, but uh, she was exceptional. Even some of her frees really kept us in the game too. Ah, uh, yeah, like I think she covered every blade of grass in pro pair, to be honest with you. Like, she, she is very fit and like that doesn't happen by accident, like, because she'd be doing stuff off our other than what we'd be training, like, and like her fitness would be up there with anyone, you know. And I look at she, she probably has the experience, she'd probably be our oldest player, and she's a good leader. And yeah, I thought the last day, like, when we needed her, really, she came up with important scores as well. I laid on a lot and won hard ball, and as they all did, but yeah, she had a fine game. Yeah, Neve was on OTBM with the lads yesterday morning. She was chatting Hopper about, in many ways, being inspired by the teams that you were involved in in the early 90s that went back to back in the All Ireland Club hurling. That, in many ways, that may well have created a winning mentality that's filtered through to the current bunch of the Camogie team as well. Yeah, definitely don't know how I'm like, because we'd say, of the team, we'd say they played the Leicester in 93 and 94. Team of the starting team had either. For other starting or coming on as the subs in, in the 93 94 finals, like so, you know, that, that that's a high turnover, you know. But, um, I say deep down, even though we didn't discuss it much, they, they really, really wanted us to win this back to back, that you know, to kind of match the legs, you know. But, um, you know, it, I suppose we're the first club, I think, in Ireland to put both of them back to back, which is a unique achievement for, for a small area. Yeah, and in many ways, going back to back is incredibly special. Like it puts you up there with the very best teams in Camogie now. Like it's a particularly special achievement to go three and four in such a short burst of time. But to go back to back and retain your title, that's the measure of a great team who can actually retain it. Well, yeah, because in the the way it was, will in the county semi final, the county final, the All Ireland semi final, and in the All Ireland final, at the final whistle there was only a puck of, puck of a ball and in four games like Ethan Rye in the semi final there was um, three pints in it or more in the final two pints Vincent's one pint and three pints again on Saturday like you know so we were digging deep all oh, year definitely like you know the, the, nothing came soft to us I don't think there was any match we could relax into the final whistle and that's for certain and Hopper we mentioned at the start just about the, the Fela team and where it all began and I know you had told me previously that you know you had saw something in this team at that point and said that, you know, they could go on and they could win in all Ireland. So I think having a mentality like that is is pretty special that you've seen something then. You know, I don't think a lot of people think that way to think and look at a team when they're fourteen years of age and think they can go on and, and win a senior all Ireland if they stick together. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um like that would have been a massive thing at the time to win a, a under fourteen failure. Like it was a real competition like and you know, in two thousand and seven down down in uh, Kilkenny. But like I'd say, the seven of that team now on the team, the last year, there was um, uh, Laura's Lynn, Maria, Tara, Kate, Neve, Claudia, Orla. I don't think I'm leaving out anyone. Like so, that's you know that you know you, often you lose a lot of players, but to bring seven of them through to the team was, was was really good. And you were telling me as well that you train. I think it's Sunday mornings. Was it eight o'clock or nine o'clock? And you said it doesn't matter where you're living, if you're in Dublin or not, <laughs> everybody is there. Oh yeah, we train at nine o'clock. We've done that. We've done that for the last six years. Train at nine o'clock um, Sunday morning. Well, you have kind of girls, I suppose, that's going to college and that, and they might be working at living or that, like, and they just like to get it out of the way. And it's never an excuse. It's at this stage, it's it's what we do. And then we we'll say we train Wednesday night because the girls that's in Dublin, the girls in Limerick, and we train Friday night. At least they only have to come down the one night then during the week, but they, they never fail to come. Like you just the girls in Limerick, the girls in Dublin, Kildare. It's not, you know, it's a given, like you know, and they don't. They, they don't even talk about it like they're always there like and, and there's a great commitment and they're, they're a very close bunch you know and, and they back each other up and like they're the best friends outside of Camogie as well and I think that that helps Sounds to me like there's a lot of self-drive within that panel as well to be able to do that because you know sometimes a team will win and in the case of your team many of them would have been you know first time county medalists uh, just a few years ago you could win that you could win in All-Ireland and drop off by a few percent but this team seemed driven to keep the standard very very high here that's that's true, Will. Yeah, they're very ambitious. Like, and even at the minute, like I'd say, there's three days gone already, and they'll be talking about what's next, you know. And then, like, okay, we, we'll enjoy it and all that. Like, but you know, it's it's always about what's next. What can we, you know, achieve next, you know? And um, we know there's nothing nothing that we do is simple. Like, four, four of our Ireland semi finals, we've won them by a pint. One of our Ireland's a pint. Another one three pints. The other one four pints. Like, um, it's not like as if we're 
uh, getting easy rides against teams and to be easy keep going like we have to be tuned in the whole time like because the, the standard that's in it now you could name 10 or 12 club teams around the country on a given day could beat each other and, and that's the standard it's got and like I suppose playing it in Crow Park is massive you know um, it's really you're playing the best fields because often in the semi-finals you know I suppose we, the um, Lucky Drum and Inch match was in um, seemed to be so, just no on the ground it was in yeah. Kinney like in our match the board was fine but it's still it's not a patch in Crow Park like but um, you know you'd love to see maybe down the line if they could get the All-Ireland semi-finals as a double header in Crow Park as well like they're doing now with the hurling and football I think that's something to work on yeah, I think with the season being split, that's very possible that could happen. And, and like that actually made things very difficult for the semi finals. I was watching a bit of the stream of the Lock Eel against Drum and Inch game, and it, both teams had to make a decision after they had travelled that the pitch was okay to play, even though there was a bit of frost on the side of it. You may be lucky it was a few degrees warmer in Borough ahead of year game against St. Vincent's, but everyone probably wants to get the games played because they know there's semi finals that weekend and you want to be ready for Crow Park. There's maybe an argument in December with some of the bad weather we've had that maybe that's something for the Camogie Association to have a look at. Yeah, definitely. Like I'm sure the way things are going now and with the integration and all that, I'm sure Crow Park, if the right people are talked to, it would be something that could be done. And another thing probably, and I think they're going to do it next year, that you get two weeks between a semi-final and a final. But I think the provincial finals, if, if there was a gap of three weeks between the provincial finals and the All-Ireland semi-finals. But especially if you're a club that gets to um, an All-Ireland final for the first time, like, um, you know, all the rest of the the course with it. And, you know, you're kind of you're playing on a Saturday and, Next thing you have to worry about the one the following Saturday, like they don't get any chance to kind of enjoy the moment, you know. And maybe we were in a few finals, it wasn't as bad, but Lark Eel, they weren't new to it, and, and you know, the likes of that, I think they deserve the two weeks. And Opera, how much of it have you enjoyed, I suppose, managing this team? Obviously, you've managed them for a long, long time. Some of the girls were saying to me after the game, you know, they don't know it any different. You know, you, you've just always been there since they were underage the whole way up. So, how much have you enjoyed this journey? Yeah, look, at it. it's um, it's very enjoyable because the thing is, they're driving it and we're very, very lucky with the uh, people we have involved, like you know, Kevin Ward, you know, he does the training and coaching and he's absolutely top notch, like, he, um, he's a, you know, he's a brother of Laura that's full back for us and Kira that's on the panel. And like, he really, really, you know, has improved them so, so much. And then you've got Acosta or other selector, she's living up most to herself, his person, like, and if he's driving down three times a week, like she won, she won in our Ireland middle with, with Galway in their first line to full back. Like she gives so much to the club, and you know we're very lucky with them people and good officers in the club. You see, the thing about it is we're all after the one thing, and you know anything, nothing is too big to ask the finance committee or the officers. Like it's a close knit bunch, and it's not about any one person or one family or anything. It's just about the whole group. I think it's going to be a particularly special Christmas for you in Sarsfields Hopper. Thanks a million for joining us on the show. No bother. Thanks, man. Thanks, Ashley. Sarsfields. Back to back champions. So impressive. We're talking about Lock Eel there, the mm-hmm. Antrim Camogie champions. Let's have a chat about Dunloy, the hurling champions, because what a performance they put in against St. Thomas's. Like, yeah. In a lot of ways, maybe the post mortem is going to be St. Thomas's. They've won five Galways back to back. They were so impressive against Ballyhill Shamrocks in the semi final last year where TJ had to pull off that last bit of magic to actually win, which was such a better performance than the hammering they took in the final the year before against the same opposition. So you're thinking St. Thomas's are probably well primed to get back into an All Ireland final, but Dunloy did not read that script. And I thought they were excellent with the exception of maybe a 10-15 minute period where they struggled for scores in the first half. But outside that, I thought Dunloy were very impressive. Big time, yeah. It was level at half time and I thought that there was a lot of wides. Like There was a very strong wind in Crow Park, Will. It was a swirling wind, so there was a lot of wides on both sides. So I wouldn't really say that, that you know, that it, they had an off day with their wides. It was a really strong wind. So that had an effect, but uh, they just didn't show up, I think. And I think that's probably the most disappointing part of it, that they left Crow Park thinking we didn't show up, you know. And I spoke to, to Kenneth Burke after the game, their manager, and, you know, he said that when we played Bally Hale here last year, the semi final, you know, we showed up and we lost. And obviously, we know what happened there, the, the last minute free that somehow crept into the back of the net. But you know, the the disappointment this time around was that we just didn't show up. And all credit to Don Lloyd, they didn't allow them play. They absolutely didn't allow them play. And they had this fire and energy that they were going to, you know, die to win that ball. And that's really what you got from them. Like some of their scores were just exceptional. I know we spoke so much about uh, Keelan Malloy, his goal, and I oh. spoke to him afterwards. Oh, my God. So even in the press box, well, everyone just went, oh, my God. Well, there's, there's a kind of a single-minded drivenness about when he catches that ball. Because sometimes 
a player will try and maybe win a free in that circumstance or will slow down and wait for support and try and get a hand pass off. In many ways, his directness possibly caught St. Thomas's off a little bit. Yeah, they probably thought he might turn back and he knew that he'd no catches left at that point. And when he threw the ball the final time onto his hurl that he knew he couldn't catch it again, he threw it high so that he could gain that extra step really away from them and then he made that space and then he got so close into the goalkeeper that he you know it gave no chance really but uh, still it's very difficult to do that especially when there's two defenders chasing you on either side and he knew he'd no other options then at that point there was no one from Deloitte supporting him so he had to go for it and you know thankfully that he did get that goal I know a lot of people were saying they know if he was fouled there and you know if, if they were more cynical there that you know we mightn't have ever seen that goal I heard some of it talking about that afterwards but thank God he he did get that goal because definitely one of the goals of the, of the club championship if not the goal of the of the club championship at this point um, yeah he was exceptional and you know he got to be seen on a big stage and that was probably one of the points that Gregory O'Kane made after the game is that like you know he's ours thank God he's ours but if he played for maybe a Kilkenny or you know a, a more well known club team or county team you know everyone would know his name so um, yeah it was great to, to see them like on display on the on the big stage and yeah they were full value very exciting to watch so that when the point the goal goes in they go one twelve to 9 up at that stage yes and then you've got a bit of a rally from St Thomas's even to, like with about 8 minutes to go I think there was mm. 2 points in it what was very impressive from Dunloy from that point on they actually outscored the Galway champions by 4 points to 2 in the closing stages at a time when you would have almost been expecting them to hang on yeah and that was the, the probably the most surprising part about St Thomas they were so wasteful in that last maybe 10 15 minutes or so um I know at the very very end you know they had a few 65s and they were just lobbing them in constantly and I would have thought at that point you know you would have maybe had the experience and said okay right compose ourselves here and you know pop it over and you know let's see what we can claw back the score a bit and see what we can make of it but no they they were lobbing them in at that point so surprising I suppose that they didn't go for it but the Dunloy defence were so solid Will that was probably one of the, the biggest things obviously we talked about their forwards and the effect they had but that all came from the defence and that's what I spoke to Keelan about as well you know that ball he was getting inside coming from that half back full back line didn't allow St Thomas play and that was probably the difference in the end Yeah I mean Cone Cunning pulls the strings in many ways within that forward line he played a lot kind of around the 11 position um, yeah. but he was good with his freeze and he set up an awful lot for that inside forward line the thing I noticed from re-watching the game particularly Dunloy seemed to really enjoy playing at Crow Park a bit like Hopper mentioned fast pitch this time of year wide open spaces where they were able to use that pace as well mm. and at times that running game really clicked well for them yeah see the cross field balls that they were doing like Keelan was involved in a few of them as well like just the, the catches they, it was like glue and then they would pinpoint across the pitch they knew where each other were without even looking and you were thinking maybe oh go into Crow Park and you know the Crow Park factor and all of that but no not at all they they were so happy to be there and they were there not to just make up numbers and play the game they were there to win it and put on a show and they absolutely did and they were so well coached and I know we're probably going to talk about Gregory like the effect that he's had but you know he's a, a club man and the effect that he's had there he's done it himself as a as a player so he, he knows all about it and, and you can feel that respect from them when I spoke to some of them after you know you could feel that from them and yeah what a what an impact he's had well, as Ash mentioned she spoke to Gregor O'Kane who's been involved with every championship that's been won at senior level by Dunloy and this is what he had to say after the game Kane Roy's a you know he's from Sussex player you know what I mean and uh, like if he's in any other county you know what I mean they'd be talking about him but uh, look we're glad he's he's ours you know what I mean and uh, super player and as I say like somebody like him he always pops up in the right time and uh, delighted for him you know and what will this mean to Dunloy as a club the supporters out there today I've seen the reaction of the players when that final whistle went you know it, it means a lot what will it mean for the whole club but sure look GA's life, you know what I mean? It's it's families, you know, it's clubs, it's families, it's people. And if you can bring joy to people's lives and particularly our own people today, and sure look, we've given a generation of people now, young ones, uh, something else to hang to and the old people, sure, it's, it's fantastic for the community. And you've been here as a club before, 95, 96, 03, 04. You didn't come out the right side those days, but you're hoping coming up against either Ballyhale Shamrocks or Valley Gunner, that'll go your way. Well, look, sure, Bally Gunner and Bally Hill, they're farther down the road than we are and uh, look, we're just going to enjoy today and uh, try and get close to the other two, you know, the next day.
You have a lot of experience, obviously yourself as a player, being out there. So I suppose, can you give those words of wisdom to the lads? Yeah, look, you know, I was lucky. I played with great players and uh, um, I, I have a fantastic job managing this group. You know what I mean? And sure, they're enjoying it and I'm enjoying it. And all we want to do is get the best out of each other and see where it takes us. Uh, this is a very simple mission statement, but Gregory's been, I think, playing down his own abilities a little bit here. Yeah. If you consider they win their first Antrim title in 1990, he's there as a young player at that point. He plays in the All-Ireland Finals that they get to, then becomes a selector and a coach with the team. He's been involved with everything that they have won at senior level. He's a legend within Dunloy uh, and within Hurland, you know, absolutely. And he is playing it down there and I think he likes that underdog tag, especially going in against Ballyhale. Um, obviously, there'll be underdogs against Ballyhale Shamrocks, but um, I don't think Ballyhale will have it all their own way. You know, they're, they're a formidable outfit, Dunloy, and they'll be hard to stop, especially that attacking ploy that they have. But um, yeah, I think he's definitely uh, playing themselves down a small bit going into into the final saying, oh, they're far ahead than us and the whole lot, which they are, of course. But uh, no, I think they'll have a massive say going into the game. I was just looking at back of my notes here in the programme and the penalty miss on 18 minutes was probably a massive turning point as well. Um, you know, for, for St. Thomas, it gave them a lifeline at that point. It could have been a very, very different game. Yeah, no, when I rewatched uh, the games on Monday, because I was slightly distracted by the World Cup I on know. the day. Yeah. Um, I had... That on the computer, and I had the World Cup final on the TV, so I was kind of half looking. And with the World Cup final, as you mentioned earlier, went to 2 0. I was easy able to go, right, I'll concentrate on Bally and Shamrocks and Bally Gunner for a little <laughs> while. And then next thing, Mbappe decided to uh, bring that game back to life with about four minutes left in Crow Park in the minutes, second game. Yeah. Um, but when it came to the first one, I wondered for Deloy at one point. So it was 15 wides they clocked by the end of the game, mm. plus the missed penalty, plus a few they dropped short into the goalkeeper along the way. So they, the plus side to that is they will say they created loads of chances. Yeah, and we talked about the Crow Park factor. Maybe that might have been something in there too. And I mentioned the wind. The wind was very, very strong. So that was something as well that you'd have to take into account. But they've had their day out there now. And yes, they had those wides, but they'll be hoping, you know, once you get over one game in Crow Park, that they have that experience now and that they'll drive on. But uh, obviously it's a, it's a a massive step up for them against Ballyhale because I do think St. Thomas didn't show up at all. But again, as I said, they, they weren't allowed to play. Um, and the disappointment, even in Kenneth, like it's hard to do those interviews after a while, you know, with someone who's so, so disappointed. But, you know, he, he just couldn't understand what went wrong. And he just said, you know, I, he spoke to the players after and he said, you know, we'll speak again soon and just try to pinpoint what happened here. But, um, yeah, I don't think you can ever take away from you could see a visible morning. frustration at different times. So mm. Connor Cooney, very unlike him, he's been so important in the freeze for them over the last five years plus. Yeah, He missed three frees in a row and you could feel the frustration on him when he missed them because it's so uncharacteristic for him to um, miss them in the way that he did because he didn't look confident as they went on. And this was also a spell in the game when Dunloy weren't scoring and you're thinking if St. Thomas are going to win this and if they're going to get out of the bit of the rut that they're in, they need to kick on and get scores now. And mm. it didn't happen for them. Didn't happen, no. And then they were getting frustrated and that was really evident as well. Probably what I alluded to of, of the end, coming towards the end of the game and lobbing the ball in. Mm -hmm. You could see this frustration when Dunloy looked like the more experienced team maybe out there. And, you know, they, they, they took their points. And in fairness to Dunloy, there was probably more scores that they could have got as well. You know, they... They brought it in maybe for a goal chance a few times and, you know, that they, they had opportunities there as well that went wide. But uh, for St. Thomas, it'll be just a lot of lot of disappointment because I think if you go away from a game and you see the amount of wides you had and you think they're the chances, you know, when you're in these big games, if you don't take them chances, you're not, you're not going to get over the line. And yeah, I think they they were just devastated going away. But uh, what a team. They're a brilliant team, but it's just tough when you're constantly there, thereabouts, but just never over the line. But uh, yeah, they, they'll be back, they'll be back. But it was Dunloy's day and they were full value. Mm. Well, I'll be quick to point out, it has been their day in four All-Ireland Finals. They've gone to previous season. Maybe yep. they're, they're due a bit of a rubble look here. Uh, we'll hear from the Ballyhill Shamrocks camp in a moment. And Sarah Donovan's going to join us to look at that second uh, semi-final as well. But as I think back about Crow Park, the, the more and more I think about it, the more of an own goal it felt with the scheduling of the games on Sunday. Um, because it was quite a small crowd there, despite the fact that the games were potentially very very interesting and I think mm -hmm. a lot of people who would have went into Crow Park normally to watch Ballyhale Shamrocks and Ballygunner particularly were understandably at home watching a huge occasion where France are playing against Argentina like I think the official attendance clocked in a, a little over a couple of thousand which within Crow Park is an awful pity it, it's a cavern yeah. when it's that empty 
big time and like you, obviously I'm up in the press box that bit higher and even when you're looking down onto the Hogan stand you, you couldn't really see many people because they're probably underneath the covering because it was a, it was raining as well that day but um yeah an own goal and you just can't understand it because you knew the scheduling of the World Cup for a long time now so you knew that was going to happen so it was just overshadowed and we've tried so hard in the last couple of years and a split season to get you know, the club championship out there to get, let it be seen. And Bally Gunner, Bally Hale in particular, you know, there was a lot of anticipation for that game. And, you know, it was on the exact same time that potentially at that point, Messi was going to go on and win his first World Cup. And, you know, even if you're not a soccer fan, probably you're a sports fan if you're watching the Hurling. So you're going to want to watch Messi go on and do this. And he did in the end. And what a game. It probably went down as one of the best World Cup games ever. Um best games ever so it was completely overshadowed and it's such a disappointment because like, even underneath some of my interviews like I think people wrote who cares Messi won the World Cup <laughs> I was just like yeah why did they schedule it at this time you know it was such a pity and yeah yeah just even for the lads I'm sure they were happy to be out there in Crow Park but you'd wonder if it was in a, a tighter pitch in, in Turles or wherever you know that it would have been even a better game better atmosphere you know some of the best club games that I've been at now the athletic grounds in our is a brilliant pitch for them and it's a bit more closed in it's still a great stadium and all the rest of it but um, yeah it's just it's hard because then you'd, you could ask some of the players and they said I'd never give up the chance to, to go out in Crow Park but um, yeah I suppose we're talking more about put it on at a different time put it on later on, on the Saturday even if they could have maybe pushed the Camogie slightly like, earlier or maybe a different weekend if possible but yeah I'm sure there was options Will yeah yeah yeah, it's missed exposure for what was a huge, huge game. Well, Ballyhead Shamrocks came through by a goal in the end, one sixteen to sixteen points. And Ash caught up with Pat Hoban, the manager of Ballyhead Shamrocks, after the game. That might have been the speculation of the press and some of the experts out there. We know the quality of the Ballyhale players, absolutely. I mean, people have questioned. We haven't put two halves together. I think today we answer a lot of those critics. And you really stepped up today. I thought tactically, you got it right. A lot of the matchups, they they really worked out defensively. You were solid. Yeah, very very solid. You know, I think our full back line coming into this game, everyone would have said we'd be under pressure. Our half back line would have been said run at them. They're under pressure. I think today we showed the character we have right across the team. But yeah, I'd give huge praise to our full back line. Young Killian Corcoran in there, only 18 years of age. You know, marking another young superstar. But I just he, he proved he could put it up to anyone. And you went in level at half time and then in the second half it was really 40 minutes gone that you really got that purple patch and there was two penalties. TJ stepped up for the first one, it was well saved and then the second one he made no mistake. Yeah, and like, to be honest, in the first half, we created two good goal chances. Uh, great credit to Stephen O'Keefe. He pulled off some remarkable saves today that probably kept Bally Gunner in the game. But at halftime, we felt, look, we can create chances. We are looking the likely team to get a goal. Uh, and thankfully, you know, we created the chances. They kept pushing on and TJ showed um, huge courage, I suppose, and his ability to actually stand up to that second ball and put it away. Yeah, 1A today from TJ. He's just exceptional. He always steps up in those big moments and he almost orchestrates things, you know, all throughout the pitch. And you really need your leaders like that to stand up in a massive game like today. Yeah, I think in the second half, he particularly stood up. You know, he came out around the field, one ball, one freeze, brought lads into the game. But, you know, we, we, have, a, we have a lot of great leaders on that field. I think Colin came in today, you know, with people maybe, you know, all the, all the talk and the press about whatever was said or not said and all of that. I think he answered all his critics today. What, that he wasn't uh, playing as well or what was said? I don't know, there was comments about some comments from last year or the, oh. the previous final, but um, I think the talking was done on the pitch today. And last year, obviously, it was against Bally Hale. It was a last-minute goal from Harry Ruddle. Was that in the back of your minds coming in today? I'm sure it was. It had to have been. Um, not particularly, but I suppose with, with time up and three, three points in it and some balls coming into the square, it's concerned that they get a goal. But uh, I think they learned from that, you know, and we were going to close out that game no matter what. And you celebrated um, out there as if you's, you know, you were true to this final. It meant a lot. You could see that in your faces. Yeah, the big disappointment last year like, was ultimately losing the All-Ireland. You know, the opponents are irrelevant. Today was about getting to an All-Ireland. Today is a semi-final. They've got back to where they want to be and now they want to go on and prove that they can be All-Ireland champions again. And in the first semi-final today, it was Dunloy, the Bet St. Thomas's. Maybe a bit of a shock there, people said. Had you looked at uh, Dunloy or St. Thomas's before this game? No, to be honest, we don't look ahead that far. Obviously, you know, we have some, some data on some of the matches and county finals, etc. But we haven't done any, any look at that. Today was about winning this game. We have a bit of time now to get our homework together. 
obviously a couple of injuries to get right as well and I think that was important today as well we were down two players after 15 minutes we brought in our subs they stood up you know the last day we got a bit of criticism about not bringing on players when we needed to bring on players we brought them on and they did the job so fair play to them there you go. Sarah Donovan is with us now. Was watching the game at Crow Park at the weekend, and Sarah, you get Ballyhale Shamrocks there, right? Top of the tree in Kilkenny after their title win this year. Uh, they're potentially going to try and win a ninth All Ireland in a few weeks' time into a fourth successive final, and yet they're motivated by the idea of we were written off a little bit going into this game. <laughs> I thought that interview was very prickly. It's interesting that a team that Colm Keyes described at the final whistle as potentially the best and most successful club team of all time are still feeling like they don't get enough praise. Yeah, it was strange. Um, that's what I said to him. I said, you know, you never write Ballyhale Shamrocks off because I didn't want to go in with the sure. question you were written <laughs> off going in here today. And he said, yeah, um, a lot of people, you know, were talking about us during the week and, you know, saying that we maybe weren't the team we, we were previously were. But uh, no, I do think they probably hadn't shown Ballyhale Shamrock's level up to now maybe at times but because they I suppose as teams had always clawed back into the game um, Kilmico Croaks you yeah. know in particular but no like you, you've seen the, the quality there you've always seen the quality there you're but, never writing them off uh, we were both in Croke Park for the Kilmacud game and I yeah. think the Kilmacud game the second half that they had the lack of answers that Ballyhale had in that game and Colin Fenley referenced it after he said we in his interview he said we couldn't get on the ball mm. and then you're thinking okay teams are finding a way so Kilmacud had pace which we knew they had Ballygunner have pace which we know they have and I suppose that's where we were looking at it does you know can pace out, out will physicality and and it had for Kilmacud in that second half potentially they could have won that game so I wouldn't be surprised that people are starting to question you know Bally. At Bally Hill in terms of what they have left in the tank because of that lack of pace. Mm. Yeah. Look, the answer to the questions, and I'll admit I sat here three weeks ago, asked it to me who do you think is going to win, Bally Gunner and Bally Hill Shamrocks. My thought was that the evidence was there hadn't been a consistent performance from Bally Hill Shamrocks since they'd come out of Kilkenny. And that second half was very worrying mm. the way they drifted out against Kim McCudd. And really, Bally Gunner had done nothing wrong in their run back to the semi final. You think about the second half against Napiercy, they had looked really, really impressive. They'd injected some more pace and youth into their forward line. There was every reason to think that Bally Gunner we're probably going to come out on top. And even during the game itself, and we'll talk about all the saves that Stephen O'Keefe had to make, but in the first half, Ballygunner actually had quite a bit of control and had quite a bit of the ball. But Ballyhill Shamrock's put in an almighty second half performance. Can't question their second half performance, mm. but I, I felt in the first half, looking down from the eaves of Croke Park, it was four on two. So Ballygunner were having, kind of playing three in their midfield and they were allowing Richie Reid to sit w uncontested. And even though it was four on two, so you had four Ballyhill backs versus two Ballygunner forwards, the Ballygunner forwards were, were getting their way. You know, they were getting scores. Patrick Fitzgerald popped up with three points. Desi Hutchinson had some great scores. Even though they were outnumbered, their pace was a big issue for that side. And I suppose that's what, that was my concern at halftime. I was like, right, they found a way. They're, they're overloading them at midfield, which is obviously, I, I think the purpose of that was to stop that incredible Ballyhill half forward line from getting ball. So uh, Mikey Mahoney was sitting in the middle of the field, Park Mahoney was with him. It was basically a shield, you know, in, in front of that half forward line. And the lads up front were making hay with, with even though there was a, they were being outnumbered by that very physical Ballyhill full back line. And maybe that comes down to a good call on the Shamrock sideline then to mm. withdraw Adrian Mullen a little bit back. Like you want to get him as close to goal as you possibly can. But at the same time, and we saw Colin Fenley even drift out a bit yeah. in the Kilmacud game when they needed to get guys on the ball. But in the case of Adrian Mullen coming out around midfield, that seemed to really change things for them. It did. Mm. And I, I, I made that point to you. I said, yeah. look at the setup. This is very strange. You know, they're, the midfield is, is, is packed and then you have this four on two scenario. But because of that pace, it wasn't affecting Ballygunner. But in the second half, that withdrawal to midfield, the, the, the inside line was starved. Proof is in the pudding. Patrick Fitzgerald is removed. Um, Mikey Manny is removed. All of a sudden, two lads who were doing really well in the first half are being taken out and Ballygunner felt that they had no answers. Mm. I don't mean this now. We were talking about this outside, Ash, earlier on, in any kind of disparaging way to Owen Cody. But Stephen O'Keefe is incredibly unlucky, Sarah, not to be player of the game here. He because was player of the game. He had to have been. Seven or eight goal what chances. You can see the penalty that was saved. And then there was four or five really good goal chances that he made saves from. And any of them go in and the game could have been dead and buried for Ballygunner. He was remarkable. I said to you afterwards, I thought 
the, the fair result would have been a 4 16 to 16 points would have been a better reflection in the end with the amount of goal chances and with with the awesome performance of Stephen O'Keefe he probably overshadowed what was you know a poor Ballygunner performance with, when they had promised so much yeah I think that they would accept that I don't think yeah. they showed up yeah. but yeah Stephen O'Keefe he was 100% the, the player of the game and no disrespect to Owen Cody you know he had a good game particularly in the second half I thought he came into his oh, own three big scores yeah, yeah especially when they needed him but uh, yeah just some of those saves were just top class you know I saw well. yeah Owen Murphy tweeting afterwards to say Stephen O'Keefe is the goat there's yeah. no there's no question about <laughs> I don't, it I don't mind. there's plenty of people who would say that Owen is probably the goat so <laughs> I think ultimate it is it is and it's lovely that they have such a, a good relationship where they, where he can tweet immediately after the match in awe of somebody who he's now going to try and replicate as quickly as he can you know that's that's Stephen O'Keefe to, to yeah. tea, isn't if it? I'm mm. David Fitzgerald I'm knocking down his door <laughs> I'm spending the rest of the winter just saying please come back in next season because his puck outs his saving he's an incredible he's solid yeah he really is I think even the, the penalty in particular you know I see TJ Reid stepping up and I'm sure there's a bit of fear in that itself but obviously not from him like what a save um, it's a full length stretch it's, yeah, it's an incredible it's an incredible yeah. save and yeah for TJ look even when he gets the second when he makes no Ice mistake in the veins Ash like it mm. would have been very easy for him to turn around to one of his mates and there's plenty of good dead ball strikers on that uh, Ballyhill Shamrock team he could easily have turned around and said look someone else take it it's too soon after it's just been saved TJ will step up takes responsibility yeah big time but that's the type of player he is you could see he orchestrates things doesn't he he has that presence and composure and calmness even against Kill McCord I remember he broke that uh, the massive catch yeah, the, yeah 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 it's, it's the opportunity that he has and he, he gets one chance to win an incredible ball and the, the pocket of space that he opens up for his teammate he, that's mm. the defining thing for me about TJ Reid is, is the ability to catch ball out of nothing and create a masterpiece you know and he scored 1-8 again the last day one yeah, incredible you know and just, and just tipping along you know very mm. comfortably tipping along and that's, that's a testament to how fit he is um, considering his age but uh, you know and it belies the fact the amount of strength and conditioning work that he does behind the scenes uh, and, and that comes out in those performances in December like yeah. he's been going since January yeah of, easy oh, for t- probably five years now in terms of the cycle mm. as a player but it just shows that every day the top top players have to keep tipping tipping away every day doing the doing routine things you know the mobility yeah, and all the rest of it all the stuff away from the team mm. yeah to give some credit to a defender Joey Holden had a very very good game I think as a as a standout performance considering the the pace that Ballygunner showed in the first half they never panicked you know they just they got to grips with them and again that it's about that um, character that Kilkenny teams inevitably show every single year it's like okay we're under pressure here let's see where we can make uh, make ground and and that second half they just Mm -hmm. shut them down where do you stand on this greatest of all time? This happened so many times this weekend for various <laughs> different reasons. But, but like Colin was saying, there's a very strong argument for this Ballyhill Shamrocks team with all that they've won in the last decade in particular, transitioning a team away from, say, Shefflin and McFenley's team into this current bunch and bringing in some of these incredible young players that are now on the team. If they were to win three and four seasons, if they were to beat Dunloy Cullens in the final, they're a Harry Ruddle last gasp strike away from being a four in a row team. Which is absolutely incredible when you consider that there's 180 playing members in the club. Wow, didn't know that. And then you add all the all-stars and club medals that are in there over the last 50 years Mm. would be remarkable. But they're working off a club panel of, what, 22 players, you Mm. know, versus other clubs. And, you know, we could name a myriad of them in Dublin who have nine teams stretching from senior to junior Z. These guys literally have 22 players who have to be fit every single year to take on 10, 15 different teams in a year to, to, to go back to the top. So there's no question that they are going to be, if if they pull this off against Dunloy. Dunloy are going for their was fourth fourth shot yeah. at the title. Either fifth. Fifth, fifth final. Last fifth four. final. Four yeah. losses. <sighs> to pull this off, that that blip last year, you know, losing to Ballygunner in that way, I don't think that will take from the fact that I, I do genuinely believe they are the best club hurling team. Do Dunloy take a lot of spirit though from the way they played against St Thomas's the last day? Yes, very sharp, very focused, came in under the radar. I, I think though they were probably blessed by the fact that people didn't necessarily know a lot about them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they probably exposed themselves uh, and how good they are, which is something that Ballyhale will go right 
very pacey here with Nigel Elliott. Keelan Malloy's distribution is incredible. We're going to have to park somebody in front of Keelan Malloy to stop him. Um, giving the ball to Conal Cunning. If we cut out Conal Cunning, you know, all of a sudden that triangle of of scoring opportunities is cut down. So the performance and the the I suppose the consistency that they showed the last day could be their undoing. Yeah, and the thing is, for both sides, they can't mm. afford to be as wasteful as they were. I mentioned that earlier, 15 wides for Dunloy, they'd be a bit disappointed mm. with. In the case of Ballyhill Shamrocks, many of those goal chances they will have felt were very takeable. Even, I think, at the rebound that Colin Fenley tapped over the bar yes. as opposed to going under and different things that happened along yeah. the way. They will feel that they should have taken some of those goal chances. And maybe on a different day, when you see a clinical Ballyhill Shamrocks, I think back to the Leinster final last year, that's a team that have six or seven goals in them, potentially. Oh, I, I don't know if Adrian Mullen could have been more clinical. Like, you know, they were low balls. Like, Stephen O'Keefe is going full stretch. Yeah. I'm going to say any other day Adrian Malloy has a hat-trick, you know, or, you know, TJ Reid has two penalties in the bag. Mm. And, yes, Colin Fenley, uh, it's a goal poacher. You know, he, he went at it. He, he was there to react to it. He was unlucky that it went over the bar. But I think Stephen O'Keefe, aside... They would have won that game for 16 to 16 points and we would have been talking about the power that they have up front. And I think it was the matchups probably as well for Bally Gunner. Like Bally Hale took players out of the game. I know we spoke about it. Like Desi Hutchinson was quiet mm. in that first half. You know, he wasn't allowed play. And I think that's probably something they'll target against Dunloy. Mm. Um, you mentioned Keelan, like they, they, of course they're going to be targeting him, but they got that so right. And I think they went in as well, so frustrated and that hurt from last year. Like you could definitely sense that, yeah. you know, that was definitely probably one of the big things as well. But uh, I just felt that with, with Keelan, uh, when we were watching him, he was dropping right back mm. into kind of, I suppose, left side of midfield. And all of this space was opening up in front of him. And the Thomases were really slow to cover it off. And I don't know, is it that they felt that he's so far back the field that it's not going to be a danger. But on two occasions, he picks a pocket. He's, I'd say he's on maybe his 45, just, just heading into midfield. And he delivers a 60-yard pass, like an arc, yeah. out, to the, out to the right corner to Conal Cunning. And... It opens up, it, it takes 10 players out of the game. And he misses the first one, Conan Cunning, it, it skids past him. And the frustration Keelan had, uh, you know, he was like, yeah. Geez. and then he says, right, I'll go again. Does the exact same thing again. And to me, Ballyhale won't allow him to do that. No. Like, that's, that's what I'm saying is they've shown a lot of their cards in this semi-final to win it. Yeah, would they be incredibly aware, like they'll watch the video, they'll see that stick passing in the diagonal, yeah. which was very effective. Yeah. Ballyhell Shamrocks will probably just move their positioning around a little bit and they're very good at closing the door. Yeah. Like I still wouldn't write off Dunloy here though. No, Absolutely no. not. Like I think they're really exciting like to, mm. to watch and I don't think in any way it was any type of fluke. I don't think St. Thomas has turned up, but I don't think they were allowed to play. You know, I have to, I definitely would give them full credit. I know what we're saying against Ballyhell Shamrocks, it's a, it's a tough task. But, geez, I do think it's probably going to be maybe closer. They're not going to have it all their own way. I did say last week that I felt that Bally Gunner's pace would have been, a, it would have made the game different against Dunloy. I'm not saying that that Bally Hale are the slowest men on earth. I'm just saying that they don't have the same place that Bally Gunner have. And, you know, I think they would own up to that themselves. There is mm. definitely a quick twitch with Bally Gunner that other teams don't have. But that physicality that Dunloy have... Will th it'll be a better game yeah. than the Ballygunner game? I don't want uh, Dean Mason to feel left out in the goals for <laughs> Ballyhill Shamrocks when we talk about Stephen O'Keefe because the save he makes from Hutchinson is actually coming at a crucial period of the game. That hits the net. Ballygunner probably get a second wind going into that last eight or nine minutes of the game. And we actually questioned when we were watching it: should he have taken a point because he would have brought mm. it back to three? Mm. Um, I think Ballygunner or Ballyhill get a score. And all of a sudden it's back out to four again. And we were saying, oh, and, and they miss a free. Park Manny misses a free immediately after that. And you're saying, God, there, there's two chances to bring it back within two yeah. points. And there was just that kind of gameplay was chess. Strange. It yeah. never happens with Ali Gunner. You're, yeah. you're wondering what's going on here. But looking at the positioning, I think Desi was right to take it. You know, I, I would have felt yeah. as a forward, it opens up in front of you. Absolutely, I'm going to take a, take a chance. So... In the end, mm. we're we're probably being a bit conservative, saying that and Port Manny's free, and we bring it back to two. 
but instead it, the lead stretches out to four and then it goes out to five and, and then the game's gone beyond them. Just before we go, Sarah, how impressive have you been by Sarsfields? We were ta- chatting to Hopper McGrath earlier. Like three and four is some achievement. Absolutely incredible. And again, a group in Galway. The Galway champions um, were tested this year. Like Oren Moore Marie, it was 2-11 to 2-9, I think. And I watched back the game and the likes of Neve Hanafy, Rachel Hanafy, really, really pushed the Sarsfields team. So although there isn't a Connacht Championship and they do go straight into an All-Ireland series, the competition in Galway is so competitive that if you win it, you nearly have a base to come into the All-Ireland Championship anyway. Um, from the amount of injuries that they've had, you know, replacing Oral McGrath, mm-hmm. yeah. a big, big Massive. task. Sarah Spellman played centre forward in the county final. She was injured, obviously, and came on to play wing back in the All-Ireland Club final. You know, your your centre forward is a pivotal role to lose that player twice. Yeah. <laughs> and then for Rachel Murray to step into that role and have an incredible season, uh, the goal she got in the All-Ireland final on, on Saturday night. What I'm most impressed about is the run that Orla McGrath makes, Rachel Murray has replicated. So it just shows if you're training with players who are consistently doing the right thing and you will automatically... The system almost becomes second nature. Mm. You will learn. And I suppose this is what we're talking about with Bally Hale. We've replaced Shefflin. We've replaced uh, Michael Fenley. The players that have come in literally do what those guys did previously. So Sarsfields, they've, they've literally created a system where the younger players now just do automatically what the old players have done. And it's it was so exciting to watch. Camogie, for me, the best, best teams can link the play really well. And that's why those two teams were in the final on Saturday night. Sarsfields and um, I, I yeah. Lachiel, the best teams to link the play. Oh, they're fabulous. The best yeah. teams to link the play. Mm-hmm. I, Drummond Inch and Vincent's, you know, I've played with Vincent's for six years. They got so much right. And to lose an All-Ireland by a point, or All-Ireland semi-final by a point, mm-hmm. you've done very little wrong and you can feel very hard done by there's an extra step there and it's about linking the play from your half back line to, to your inside line to get more out of the game. Ashling Mar scored 10 points of the 110. There's five other forwards there. Neve Heatherton, who we know as an incredibly good footballer, was the link player there that they didn't use and that she's the player that you need to get on the ball and that's the next step for Vincent's. Great weekend of action at Crow Park. Yeah. You both got to enjoy all of it. <laughs> yeah, Merry, all of it. <laughs> a, mer- a Merry Christmas to both of you. Uh, you will. We will be back with the Club Championship Show, which of course is proudly brought to you by AIB in the new year. Next up for us in a couple of weeks' time, we'll be looking forward to the football semi-finals as the build-up continues to the All-Ireland Finals on the third weekend of January. Chat to you soon. The Club Championship Show on OTB in partnership with AIB. Proud sponsors of the Football Hurling and Camogie All-Ireland Club Championships. Hashtag the toughest.